I will live a life that God called me to. And I believe in calling. And I don't believe in just uh, calling the ministry. I've heard people say, well, I was never called to that. I believe God calls us unto himself. When I was lost in my sin, God let me see my sin. And God let me see his grace and his goodness and his love. And I get, there was a drawing in my life, a passionate drawing. I've, I've, I've told people that I felt like I was going to explode because God's love was calling me to himself in such a mighty way. And I had reservations. I had doubts. But I, the, the, the greatest thing that I ever did was just let go and just let God do what he wanted to do in my life. And I, that happened to me as a, a young child. And I've heard him calling me to himself ever since then. He's called me to assurance. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where he gave me great assurance in my life. He called me and told me that he loved me in a unique way. And a thousand times, 10,000 times 10,000, of all the times when I have sinned and I've walked away from him, but he would call me back unto himself with love. And let me feel that warm embrace, uh, to feel what forgiveness really is, to feel um, what joy and peace really is. You see, uh, I, I believe that God was calling me into ministry much earlier than I accepted that call into ministry. But I had to prepare myself. And, and really, there was a time in my life that was uh, years before, but I had to get Brian right and so that I could be ready for the calling that God was going to call me to. And it was a calling every day unto himself. Now, it, let me just begin by saying, if, if you have your Bible open to Mark chapter 9, but let me just begin by saying, if you're hearing my voice, whether you're watching online, whether you're in this building, and you've never come to the first calling that God wants to place upon your life, and that is turning from your sin and asking God to do a work of salvation in your life, you really have nothing to build on. Because until you do that, then, then God may be on one side of the door knocking, wanting to come into your heart, but, 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 he, but you're on the other side and you're saying, no, you can't come in. And until you allow God, he may knock on the door, but until you allow God to come in, then you can't have fellowship with him. But how wonderful it is. Let me say this again. How wonderful it is. I don't want you to miss this. For the rest of all eternity, how wonderful it is to know him and to have a relationship and to grow in his grace in his mercy and his love. The first decision you need to make is feel the conviction that he brings and that he's calling you to him, unto himself and surrender your life unto him. And I promise you, he will save you in a way, oh, a glorious way, a wonderful way, a magnificent way. And then for the rest of your life, I pray that you'll just never get over it, how wonderful he really is. But listen to me, there's, there's an also a calling in a relationship unto himself. And that's what we're doing this year. At New Holland, we're taking this year, and we're, we've made this statement, we want more of God and less of us. We want to hear his calling uh, that he has made upon our life to a relationship, a close relationship. I was uh, talking with a pastor friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, uh, a couple weeks ago. And he pastors a church, and, and in his church, Here's the, what the theme is that they're going to do in their church right now. He is, get this now, those of y'all who've been Christians for a while, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He said their theme is revival. Y'all know what I'm talking about, shake your head. How many of you know that that's a term that we don't use much anymore? It's a term that we used to use all the time. It, it was a season and a time when we who are, you, look, you can't be revived until you're first vibed, right? You got to get alive before you can let that life come to life again, right? But for those who've already trusted 
Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord, there may have been some things that, that they allowed into their life, and they may have lost the joy of their salvation. They may have seen that, that life, the, the fruit may have gotten barren a little bit. Struggles that are there. And they don't understand. And maybe there's part of their life, and they're, they're crying out to God and saying, Lord, why? Why? It is said that in every person's life, there are two days that are more important than any other day. The first day is the day that you're born. Amen? I'm not looking at you until you get there, right? I mean, that's the day that begins it all. God gave us an opportunity to have life. And, and he, he gave it to us, and, and here we are because of that. Every beat of our heart is a gracious gift from him. Every breath that we take, Every day that we get to wake up and see the sun come up, it's an opportunity to walk that day. And I am grateful for the gift of life. The second most important day is the day that you realize why. God gave you life. Now you need to understand why. Why did he make you the way that you are? Why did he give you your heart's desires? Why did he make you the way that you are and, 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 and have certain unique things about you? Because God loves you. And God wants to do an amazing work in your life. Like I said before, it begins with salvation when you receive him. But next, it begins a, a walk of walking with him. Paul talked about that a lot. To know your purpose. And to live your purpose. Some people say it's to know God and to make him known. The, the great shorter catechism says this. Uh, the great end of man is that we should glorify God and enjoy him forever. And, and it, my, my goodness, it is a joy to walk with God. And I know scripture says that we're supposed to take up our cross daily and follow him. But there is nothing like the joy of having Jesus with you. And no matter what you face, he's with you there. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And to know that if, if you're facing something, God saw it first, and God's already amended it and okayed it, and everything that happens to you, it, it's going to be okay. All things work together for good to those who are called, right? To those who are the called according to his purpose. The work of the Holy Spirit within you. God's got this. So what is your purpose? What is your plan? Hold on. What is God's plan? Now, you might not immediately realize and know that. And if that is the case, you get an opportunity, listen, every day to be drawn into the presence of God, to enjoy the splendor of his spirit. You get a, an opportunity every day to find the end of yourself and find the beginning of him. You get the opportunity every day to, to put your will aside and find God's will. Your purposes aside and find his purpose and joy and meaning and dare say significance. What are we going to do throughout all of eternity? Get to know him better. You think that we could limit God? Of all the, well, you can think of whatever number you want to think of. There, there's a, a galaxy out there that has over a billion suns that are all bigger than our sun. All galaxies within galaxies within galaxies. Amazing. Do you think that we could actually fully uh, comprehend all the things of God? We got all eternity to spend with him. All eternity to learn greater, more and more of his love and his uniqueness. So we get to grow into that. It begins at salvation. But how many of y'all have messed up since then? Amen. How many of y'all have had questions since then? How many of y'all need a new beginning since then? Well, God is calling us into himself. And what we're doing here at New Holland is we're trying to follow the example that Jesus placed in front of us. Jesus, the Son of God, walked this earth. 
And as he walked this earth, there were certain things that he did to make sure that there was nothing between his heart and the Father's heart. He faced everything that we faced, yet without sin. There's no temptation that you'll face that he didn't face first. No hardship that you'll feel that he hadn't also felt. So we're going to look at his life. And we're going to, we're going to talk about some things that are called spiritual disciplines. And every day we're going to seek to do them. Now my prayer is this. I can preach this until I'm blue in the face. And I probably will do this. That means for the remainder of my days I'm probably going to preach this. But you're going to have to hear it from God for yourself. And I pray that you hear something from the Word of God today. As we look in Mark chapter 9, an experience there that will help you in your daily walk with God. Are you ready? Now, I know I've already used this scripture many times, and, and I promise you I'm going to probably use it even more. That's all right. You'll get over it, right? Amen? In Mark chapter 9, this wonderful uh, time when, when uh, Jesus is there with his disciples. Now, he had spent some time on the mountain with God, and he was transfigured. I mean, it was a glory hallelujah moment. Praise God for those moments. Y'all had any of those? And you just think, I, I just wish that I, I could just uh, never lose this feeling. Well, life goes on, right? And we face the hardships and the difficulties of life. So he comes down the mountain, and he, he sees uh, uh, the scribes and his disciples fussing. And, and he asked them, why, why are you fussing with my disciples? And a man stepped forward who had a child who was controlled by evil demonic spirits. Now, anybody who says, I don't believe in that, come hang out with me for a while. Because I, I see that evil working all the time. And, and, and if you want to know that it's real, just look around you. I promise you it's real. And Satan wants to tell you it's not real, but Satan wants you under, the, under his control, and God wants you under his control. So this, this father comes with his child, and he explains that he brought his child to the disciples so that the disciple, or so that Jesus could, could make this oppressive spirit leave. From the time his child was young, it, it had taken over him to the point that his child could not speak. Can you see the father's love for his child? Can you see how he wants the best for his child? And, and, and all the things that he had tried, but nothing worked. Did y'all hear that? All the things you know that that father had tried. Fruitless. Nothing worked. And maybe in frustration, maybe he felt like it was his last chance. But it was his best chance. And he brought his child to the one that he had heard had done miracle after miracle. The lepers were clean. The blind could see. The lame could walk. This man who could do anything and all things. And he's wondering. And as this man, Jesus is talking to this man, this spirit took over, this evil spirit took over the child and threw him to the ground and he began to have almost like a seizure and foam at the mouth. Now you would think at that moment everybody would have just dropped down and tried to, to comfort and, and help, right? That would be the normal thing. If we were here in this room and somebody began to have a seizure, we got some medical people in here and they would be over there trying to help in any way they could, right? But the great physician's right there and, and it's almost as if he is looking over or ignoring, and he begins to talk directly to the father. How long has it been this way? Since childhood. Let's li let me just re let read to you what Scripture says here. Verse number 21. This is Mark chapter 9, verse number 21. So Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood, and often he has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. If you don't know that Satan fears us and Satan wants to keep us in darkness and Satan wants to bring harm, then you don't know the power of evil. And this, this child was under this, this satanic control and wants to destroy him. But here the father, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us 
and help us. And here's the, here's the money statement in verse number 23. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And, and I said this last week, and I, I'm not going to stay here long, but I hope you hear it. I hope the Holy Spirit amens it. This is for you too. This is not just for that day. The same power of God is still at work today. The same blessings of the Holy Spirit is still working today. The same needs that man has can still be met by God today. If you can believe, if you can trust, if you can come to the place that you say, Lord, I can't, but you can. There is not anything that you face that God can't take care of. All things are possible to him who believes. And all God's people said, amen. you need to amen that in your life the next time you face a problem. You need to remember that. You need to cry out to God and say, Lord, I believe. And that's exactly what happens here. The, immediately, verse 24 says, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He said, Lord, I came because I heard. There was something in my spirit that knew that if I brought my child to you, you could take care of it. Lord, I know you've done it. I've heard. I'm, I've seen it in other people's lives. I've heard their testimonies. And Lord, I believe that you can. But Lord, I know that I'm not there yet. And I want to be there. Lord, I'm just being honest. You see, he said this immediately. He didn't have to think about it. He just looked at Jesus and said, yes, sir, I believe, but, but you're going to have to help me here. Help my unbelief. How many of you are where God wants you to be? Totally, completely. I mean, you're just lacking nothing. I don't know about you, but that last song that we sang, it, it describes my heart. I come with my daily sins before a God, and God calls me to himself to forgive me and to release me, listen to me, and grow me. Growing from grace to grace. There's this word that's called sanctification. That means that God is doing a work of change in our life. And can y'all hear me when I say this? I'm not there yet. I'm still messing up. There are days that I want to do all the things that are right, but I'm so weak in the flesh. And so, look, <clears throat> A non-Christian can be possessed by demons. A non-believer, like this young boy, can be possessed, controlled. A Christian has the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart. You cannot be possessed. There's already a spirit, the Holy Spirit, living within your heart. But that does not mean that you cannot be oppressed and that word means to put pressure upon you to beat you down how many times we find ourselves in circumstances and we feel like we're being crushed by the circumstances Satan may have a control in your life Therefore, Hebrews 12 says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us. O King James says, besets us. That means that we have things in our life, are you listening now? That are so easily entrapping us. We need to take all those weights off of us and lay them down because we need to run with freedom. And there's some areas in our life where Satan is oppressing us and we need to find victory in Jesus in those areas. I might not be there, but sanctification tells me I am growing in the likeness of God. I am moving from where I am to where I need to be. And aren't you grateful that God is able to do that? I was speaking with someone today, and they, they know that there is a movement of God in their life, and they know that they need to do some things, and, and their testimony was, I don't know if I can do that yet, and I'm like, hold on. J just understand, the greatest thing that you can do is just let go and let God. 
And my greatest regrets are all the areas in my life that it took me so long to learn that. God's calling me unto himself. He's calling me unto himself. And I find that there are times that we as believers don't know how weak we are. Y'all ever heard of a guy named Samson? Y'all can talk to me. Y'all know Samson? What do you know about Samson? Strong man. I mean, he never found anything that, that with the power of God, listen to me, the God called anointing on his life, he never found something that was of greater, that, that, that was of greater pressure. He had more strength. Whatever it was, he was a walking miracle. I mean, the power of God would come upon him and he would just bust forth with strength for the glory of God. But for those of you who've read about Samson and studied Samson, you know something else. Man, he was an evil kind of guy from time to time. He left some things into his life that he should not have let into his life. He was controlled by some ugly spirits. Can anybody relate? Matter of fact, he liked women way too much. And he liked the wrong women way too much. No amens in this building. Right? Right? We're going to ignore all that today. And, and he found himself, can we just say, far from God, far from listening to the Holy Spirit's calling in his life. He wasn't spending time, quiet time with God, prayer every day. And he found himself one day being manipulated, and he gave in to it. And with his head resting in Delilah's lap, the visible place of his strength was his hair, and it was cut from his head. I want you to hear this. This is Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Delilah called for those soldiers to come in. Verse 20 says this, So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times, and shake myself free. Hear this saying. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He got up every day and followed his path. He did what he wanted. He did what he thought was best. And every day, he got a little further away from the center of God's will. Every day, he moved a little bit more into what he wanted. And the sad thing is, he never realized the strength of God had left him until it was too late. And they came in and they took him and they bound him and they stuck out his eyes and made him a slave the remainder of his days. Don't that sound like Satan? Steal, kill, destroy. We were, we were made to bring glory unto God. But sometimes we get sidetracked. My preacher friend, he says for his church, what they want is revival. I've heard it said like this. What I'm looking for is spiritual renewal. And the way that we're going to find that is each day, Every day, coming back and saying, Lord, can we spend some time today? I need a fresh glimpse into your word. I need to hear you. I need to take all my burdens off. And by, Lord, by, by prayer, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to adore you. And, and, and Lord, I'm going I'm to thank you. And Lord, I'm going to come and I'm going to take all of these weights and the sins that does so easily beset me, and I'm going to lay them down before you so that I can live a life of strength and face that day. Now, you say, preacher, you've already talked about Mark 9. Let me get to you to what I want you to hear today. Let's get back to Mark chapter 9. So Jesus is talking to the Father, and the, Lord, the, the Father says, Lord, I believe, help now my unbelief. Then all the other people, remember this child is having a seizure. 
And everybody's running up like they're going to do something. So Jesus turns immediately, and he looks to that child and says, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him. And by the way, don't come back. And the Spirit of God took those words and made it come alive. And what a glorious reunion as the father looks at that child and picks him up. Freed up. No longer possessed and oppressed and depressed. Amen? And the relationship with the father and the son is one. Now, in Mark 9, it quickly moves away from it to the place that they're at a house. And the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, why could we not? Lord, we've done it before. We've cast out demons before. We've healed people before. And we, Lord, we cared. We wanted to help. Lord, why could we not? Y'all ready for this? Here's Jesus' reply, verse number 29. This kind can come out by Nothing but prayer and fasting. He says, when you're dealing with this kind, you can do all you want to. You can try all you want to. You can try everything you've ever read about or ever thought about. I'm here to tell you, it's not going to work. It doesn't matter how many sermons I've preached. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter how much of this word I have read and studied or memorized. No. No. The only thing that can deal with this is the power of God. And the only way that you're going to have that power of God, listen to me now, availed in your life is through prayer and fasting. Now, I know some translations out there, they they don't like that word fasting. So when you read versions like the NIV, I'm not against the NIV, but when the NIV came to this, they said, this kind cannot come out except by prayer. And I believe that every part of the Word of God should be the Word of God. I don't think that there's parts of it we need to leave out. And if Jesus said prayer and fasting, I think he wanted us to hear prayer and fasting. Now, Brother Broadus, I've lost a lot of people here in my years preaching this because once I say fasting, they just tune me out. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I've had so many people come to me and say, well, that's okay for some people, but I can't do that. And then they're going to tell me all the medical reasons why they did that. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did Jesus say uh, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting unless you got a physical problem and then you can't do it and then you're excused from it. Now, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to say the word of God is the word of God for you, the people of God. Praise be to God. And we don't get to pick and choose what we're going to obey. He says, pray and fast. I'm going to talk more about fasting in here in just a moment, but I, I, want, to hear, I want you to hear Jesus' words when he said, prayer is 100% necessary. And if Jesus said it was 100% necessary, I need to admit that it's 100% necessary for me. I mean, who am I that I can have a shortcut? If Jesus said he had to pray, I think, I need to pray too, don't you? But notice what happens here. I mean, this child is having a a, a seizure, a fit, just demons controlling him, and everybody rushes up to him. Jesus does not say, let us pray. Everyone, let's gather around. Let's hold hands. By the way, we need to fast here, so real quickly, y'all quit eating doesn't do that. I'm being sarcastic. I tell everybody that's, being my, that's my spiritual gift, sarcasm. Jesus didn't say, let's get on our knees and let's cry out and let's pray for an hour or two hours or five hours and then we'll have the power. Listen to me. Are you ready for this? Prayer is 100% necessary, but you pray before the crisis. If you need strength, don't wait till your weakest moment to try to start spiritually getting strong. That's why we have an opportunity every day to hear the calling of God unto himself and get away from everything else, what we call a quiet time, 
And every day we get to say yes to him. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Grow me, O oh Lord. Teach me, O oh Lord. Help me, O oh Lord. You see, he had just come from a mountain where he prayed. The disciples fell asleep, but not Jesus. He had just had a glory moment in the mountain. And in life, brings you fusses and fights and difficulties afterwards. But when you walk in the power of prayer that you have done before, you can do like Jesus and just say, hey, I don't have time to get ready, but Lord, I'm already ready. So deaf and dumb spirit, come out. And by the way, don't come back. How many of you know when the crisis is coming? Me either. Me either. So wouldn't it be wise of us to get our spiritual life right and ready now? Wouldn't it be right for us to exercise with the Lord, let him exercise our spirit and grow strong by trusting and obeying and yielding every day, listening to him? We desperately need this. What happens is many times, come on now, come on now, many times we'll come and you'll hear me preach and you'll get a little bit out of it, but the rest of the week, what happens? You're too busy. I mean, you might think about it every now and again, and you'll pray over the food. And By the way, I don't believe in praying long over food. I, I prefer my food hot. Amen? Y'all good with that? But if you have time with God, I don't know what I'm going to face, but he does. And he may, he may do a blessing in your quiet time that you need that day. It's a calling unto himself, a strengthening unto himself. It's a process. It's a love relationship. As Henry Blackaby says, it's like he's, God's calling us to a date every day where we can be intimate with him. Now let's talk about, oh, by the way, when do we do our praying? Beforehand. Every day. Every opportunity. But, Let's talk about how we pray. The old preachers talked about praying through. I might talk a little bit about this next week, but let me just say, how many of y'all have just looked at something and said, God bless it, and then you just walk away? You know, there's a difference between praying for and praying through. There are times, Brother Bradley, we need to grab a hold of the horns of the altar and not turn loose. How many of you are looking for some things in your life where, where God is saying, this is what I want to do in your life? How many of you are looking some areas of weakness, those weights, those sin that does so easily beset you, and you're saying, God, I need a spiritual breakthrough? How many of you are looking for some things and you, you say, Lord, I really believe this is your will, but I can't do it. I need your help. We'll talk more about this later, but you need to circle those things and put yourself in that circle and say, I will not cease to pray until God comes through. Aren't you glad Noah didn't quit? What if he heard from God and God asked him to do something that absolutely did not make sense? Build a boat. Why? It's going to rain. Okay. What's rain? It's water from heaven. Never seen it. Well, it's coming. And by the way, this is my judgment. You need to preach. You build the boat and you preach and you warn people that God's judgment's going to come through this thing called rain. So you know what Noah did? He built a boat and he preached and he warned people. For how long? 120 years. Y'all just think I'm long-winded. 120 years he got up every day. And walked with God. What if he had given up after 10 years? What if he had been very faithful and, and, and built a boat for 50 years? Or 100 years? Or 119 years? I wonder how often we give up just on the verge of a miracle. Because we didn't pray through. We didn't believe through. We didn't trust through. I 
I wonder what would have happened. How many of y'all can testify you're grateful God didn't give up on you? Amen? Should you give up on him? You know, today, we are standing on the shoulders of a generation that went before us here at New Holland. There's some people that worked and worked hard, that loved and loved hard. There's some people that served and served hard. And you know what? They planted some trees of faith that I'm eating the fruit of. They never got to see it. But I'm enjoying what God did in their life, and I'm eating of the fruit of it now. And guess what? There's some things God's doing in my life. And through prayer, I'm planting seeds. When will they be harvested? I don't know. But do you not, do y'all realize that your prayers live longer than you? Some of you are praying for grandchildren or great grandchildren. And praise God that you are, because they're going to face some of the same difficulties or worse than you've ever faced. And, and do y'all know that prayer is a time released capsule? And God, God brings the blessing at just the right moment. Never early, but praise God, never late. So we're living on all the prayers that have been prayed for us. We're eating that fruit. But I wonder, what are we doing for the Lord today? What are we, what are we claiming for God today? What are we claiming for the next generation? What are we claiming for, for, for Gainesville after I'm in the presence of Jesus? If God tarries, what are we praying for? What are we dreaming for? What's your dreams? Are they too small? Is your God too small? What is God wanting to do in your life? What have you grabbed a hold of and said, Lord, I will not quit praying? God's able to do some amazing things. When I was 17, I was having a crisis of belief in my life. There was a crisis that was going on in my life, and I went to God, and I, I gave him one of those, Lords, I thought this was going to happen. And it didn't. And by the way, can I say praise God it didn't? I didn't feel that way at the moment. And I said, Lord, would you just give me an answer? And guess what? In seconds, faster than that, something came to me. And then he, he actually put some things with it because it was going to be one of those time-released capsules so that I would not forget because I, I'm prone to forget. He put two hooks there so that I would remember exactly what he told me. Eight years later, I'm standing there looking at exactly what God told me he was going to bring me, and I thought back on it, and I went, well, amen. And by the way, I'm so glad that he did. I'm so wonderfully, amazingly glad that he did. Can God bring you an answer like that? Sure. Sure. When I was accepting the call in the ministry, I asked God, I said, Lord, I don't want no Brian called. I don't want no daddy called. I, I, I don't want any church called. I want a God called. If you, wanna, if you want me to do this, you're going to have to make this known to me. And he told me something that he was going to do in my ministry. And get this. The very first sermon that I preached after that, the first thing that he told me happened. Now, I could not have made that happen. I couldn't have manipulated it. I couldn't have done anything. But it was like God was like saying, hey, Brian, 
I just want you to know, I heard you, and I said yes, so here it is. And when I think about it right now, all those years later, there's confidence that comes up in my spirit. Now, hiss me. The second thing he told me, I have not seen yet. But I'm looking. I'm looking. As a matter of fact, I'm closer now than I've ever been. In my spirit, I believe with all my heart. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stop praying. Praying through. Praying through. There was an evangelist that I know of up in the hills of Tennessee. He would go around to all these different places, and he would go and he would preach a revival, preach a series of meetings. And when he got there, the first thing that he would say is, who's the meanest, most honorary person in the whole town? And he would get in his vehicle. Now, this was years ago when vehicles were not comfortable like they are. And he would pray all night in that vehicle for that honorary old soul that needed Jesus. And guess what would happen? During that week, that honorary old soul would get saved. And when that honorary old soul got saved, the whole town came. Isn't it funny how somebody will just believe? Now, hold on. You can't claim what I do, and I can't claim what you do. And what God does for somebody else, that doesn't mean he's going to do it for you. But it's okay because God can do uniquely through you what he wants to do. If you let him. If you don't quit. If you believe. If you trust, if you hear him call you to himself every day, if you say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What can God do? Are your prayers the size of what you can accomplish? Or are your prayers the size of Almighty Jehovah, the loving God that he is, Jesus, the name that is above all names? Claim it today. Claim Jesus. Claim the preciousness of his work. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the calling that you placed on that word. I pray that you will call us, call us by name, speak to us personally as only you can. Remind us that you love us with an everlasting love that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. Lord, there's some things we've been praying for a long time over. And Lord, I just want you to uh, encourage in the hearts of your believers today that you're still an on-time God, that you're still able, and that you haven't given up. Lord, that you've written it down. It's in your book. And Lord, that, that the God who can will. And Lord, uh, there's some things that I might not see the fruit of, but Lord, I know that they're going to be answered because you're that kind of a God. So, Lord, let us not give up on you. Let us trust you with all of our heart. Lean not into our own understanding and always acknowledge you. And, Lord, let you direct our everyday path. Call us to yourself. Lord, let us dedicate every day to your word. Lord, to you in prayer, to yieldedness, to submission, to obedience. Almighty God, use us however you see fit. And, Lord, let it begin today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.